Hey, Beckham and Wando, I'm Fisher Bond, and you're watching East Cooper Student News. On today's show, we'll tell you all about the new attractions scaring everyone at Boone Hall's Fright Night. Lucy Beckham is trying to create the safest school they can. We'll tell you all about their latest effort. Plus, we'll shine a spotlight on one student with a huge voice. It all starts right now on ECSN. Thanks for watching ECSN. All around Mount Pleasant, you'll find several blessing boxes. A blessing box is a container where people can donate items like clothes, shoes, and non-perishable foods. ECSN reporter Jenna Zimmerman tells us more about how some people are trying to help the less fortunate in a town that is considered affluent. As traffic passes by on Highway 17, there's some people who wouldn't mind if drivers made a pit stop. We have a charge from the church and the community to help those that don't have, uh, help those that's in need. Ruthie Stokes regularly stocks a blessing box at Olive Branch Church off Highway 17. They do it to help people in need. Bring what you can, but above all, be blessed. Ruthie and Olive Branch Church are not the only ones actively trying to stock their blessing boxes. Another blessing box location is near Coleman Boulevard over by the Hibben Church. Both of these boxes are close to homes worth more than a million dollars. We like to think of Mount Pleasant as a wealthy area, but that's not the reality for some people. People in our community assume that we are all better off, but the reality is that's not true. There are still some people who need help. You think oh, it's a pretty wealthy neighborhood, but there, there are exceptions. We have people who are in long-term need, and sometimes it's in a very short-term situation, but there's definitely need in the community. Tom Cook and his wife regularly stock this box with up to $500 in groceries. Churches do what they can, but many times they rely on the public to donate. I still donate because of an experience I had when uh, one time my family and I were going out to dinner and uh, we looked outside at a blessing box and we noticed that um, a man had biked over and he was looking in the blessing box for food but there wasn't any so he was forced to leave empty-handed. We are located right here on Olive Branch AME Church Grounds off of Highway 17 right across the street from the town center. So if you have canned goods or perishable goods, please, please, please come out to help us continue to be disciples and keep our blessing box filled. Thanks, Jenna. In addition to blessing boxes, you can help those in need by donating toiletries or gently used clothes to rooms J225 at the CAS, or you can start donating to the CAS Toys for Tots Drive. Consider bringing toys to room K223 at the CAS. Every October, Boone Hall hosts their annual Fright Night, and this year, it's a little different. They have three terrifying new attractions. Here's Isaac Picard with more. At Boone Hall Fright Nights, the experience starts before you even walk through the gates. So we have three attractions this year that have all new scares, all new themes. And that's what's keeping people from coming back to one of Charleston's favorite events. Each year is a new setup for a new scare. And event director, Ryan Neal, is excited about this year's new attractions. Uh, we've got Ward 8, which is our traditional 4,000 square foot indoor walkthrough haunt. We've got Phobia, which is a brand new 20,000 square foot indoor outdoor haunt that takes you through all the different things that people fear. Death, darkness, snakes, spiders, clowns, all that good stuff. And of course, our legendary Fallout Haunted Hayride, which is a 30 minute ride through all those dark woods back there in the back of Boone Hall. Ben German has a big role in the Ward 8 attraction. And actors like him say Fright Night will be bigger, better, and more importantly, scarier. I think they're just different. I mean, this year they're bigger. There's more uh, animatronics. Um, the size of the um, phobia attraction is just a lot bigger than last time. Um, but I don't say like it. It's just different. It's just different. I like it. It's good different, though. 
Everyone seems to be in a good mood about this year's Fright Night, which is a huge payoff because there's a ton of work that goes into setting it all up. I think the biggest thing that we always kind of deal with is the fact that we're on a working farm. So um, unlike places like Universal Studios and other big commercial attractions, we don't have the concrete footing and all the electrical infrastructure and things like that. Um, so we're building in the middle of a cornfield each and every year. And so our team continues to push the boundaries of what we can do with technology uh, while still being here on a working farm right in the heart of Mount Pleasant in Charleston County. The team behind Friday Night is very excited to show the community this year's Friday Night and even the guests have high hopes for this year. Um, I think they'll be uh, interesting, more interesting than the last ones. I have high hopes for them. If you still want to go to Fright Night, tickets are still being sold for the coming weekend, the 24th through the 27th. Back at Wando, a few weeks ago, the Warriors attempted to break the record for the most minions in one place. ECSN reporter Emma Brooks tells us how the Wando gym was packed with yellow. Before homecoming, Wando and Beckham had their annual Spirit Week dress-up days. But this year, Wando's student council used their Spirit Week to do something bigger for the school. Wando is now a world record holder, but for something a little unexpected. Wando holds the world record for the most people dressed as minions together in one place. On Wednesday, October 9th, Wando had Minion Day, where students were encouraged to dress in yellow shirts and blue overalls with other minion accessories like goggles and gloves. During Wando's new tribe time, the minions assembled in Wando's gym with people counting at the door. I think we just wanted more student involvement, so getting kids to dress up in Spirit Week is a little bit hard, so having that little bit of extra incentive um, would probably influence a lot more kids to do it. I am just so grateful for everybody who dressed up and we broke the world record. Wando beat the previous record of 419 minions with the new record of 430 people dressed as minions. A lawyer assisted Wando in breaking this record, helping verify the paperwork. Wando submitted the paperwork to the Guinness Book of World Records and is awaiting official approval. Reporting for ECSN, I'm Emma Brooks. Thanks, Emma. The Wando Chorus Department has been hosting many events recently, and one student has had major roles in a lot of them. Junior Brooke Hetrick. Here's Reese O'Donnell with more. Brooke Hetrick is good at music, like really good. She plays the piano, but most people have probably heard her voice at many Wando events singing the national anthem like she did at the pep rally earlier this month. But singing didn't always come easy for Brooke. When I was little stage fright and singing louder because I was really quiet. <laughs> but she eventually overcame that stage fright and now Brooke has been singing for years and is a member of the Wando show choir. Director of the program Mr. Wilkinson says that Brooke is an asset to the choir. She sings well it's so fun to teach her and to know her and see her grow over these last couple of years of the chorus program. Chorus has given me a place to be myself and make music with other like-minded people. This was Brooke's second time singing the national anthem for the school, but she has always had a passion and interest in singing. Um, I think Brooke had a passion for singing coming into Wando Chorus, and I feel like a student like Brooke, we just give them opportunities to stretch their wings and fly even more. Um, she's a great singer. She had a lot of experience before this, but now I feel like she's had a chance to sing some more solos in different venues and really just been having a lot of fun. I want to keep it in my life and do gigs and stuff on the side. To keep singing like this. then she'll have no problem keeping music in her life. Reporting for ECSN, I'm Reese O'Donnell. Thanks, Reese. Another class that sings and does a little bit more is theater. Last year, they won first place at PDA for their performance of Puffs. And this year, they're performing Beetlejuice in the fall and Hadestown in the spring. And the performers say the show can't go on without all the help they need backstage. This production is going to be quite the um, spectacle, if you will. Uh, we've been working for weeks, rehearsing over different scenes. Uh, everybody has been working so hard and so spectacular uh, with every single character. We're going over blocking, we're going over all the dances and the songs, we're going over the different acting aspects. It's just, it is. it really takes a village and I think our uh, team that we have this year is working very hard to get that production done in the little time we have, but 
it's just going so great and I'm just grateful to be a part of the whole thing. For my first production in Theater for Honors, I really felt like instead of immediately jumping into an acting role and getting all into that process, I wanted to kind of get the lay of the land, kind of understand what was going on. So I decided to ask Mr. Moser if I could help in any technical aspects and he assigned me as assistant stage manager. That's okay, but like and the Wando PAC. Tickets are on the Wando Theater site. They cost $10 for students and $15 for adults. Our final stop in the A-Hall brings us to Wando's critically acclaimed band. They recently went on a tear. Their first competition being a regional in Conway, the second a super regional in Indianapolis, and the state championship coming up on November 2nd. ECSN reporter Sailor Picaro is here to tell you all about them. Thanks, Fisher. The band has had hard work this month, preparing for three competitions within the span of four weeks, having one more week to drill in some practice time before their state performance in Spartanburg. Fifteen-time South Carolina State Champions, nine-time Atlanta Super Region Class Finalists, five-time Grand National Finalists, four-time Bands of America Region Champs. The Wando Band doesn't get that kind of attention without putting in some serious work. The season's show is definitely one of our best in my past four years of being here. It's developed a lot um, with more dancing, like choreo movement, all of that stuff. Senior band member Alexa Hill says their overall performance has developed a lot since their freshman year. But part of that is because of how much work and effort the band spends working on it. They have three contests in the span of three weeks. Not only do band students have a crazy schedule, Wando Band Director Bobby Lambert is just as busy. I don't actually hate competition days. I can't stand them. I would, I would love to just perform and get on the bus and leave because that's what I came to do. But having to wait around for announcements and all that stuff, that's not the win for me. The win is next week when everyone's standing a little bit taller, playing a little bit stronger, throwing their equipment a little bit better. That's when it's really exciting for me. Competition days might not be everybody's favorite, but Wando Band students got a break due to previously hosting the Low Country International, which is a Bands of America competition. How you do anything is how you do everything. So how you carry yourself, how you do those things, we really focus on those easy ones, and that tends to blossom into the bigger elements as well. The band saying is how you do anything is how you do everything, and this year students are doing everything they can to be successful. It's a lot easier being a senior, but I know people like juniors who have harder coursework and just like keeping up with all of that along with all these competitions, all these practices, the Saturday rehearsals, we only really get like two days a week to ourselves in order to be prepared for all these competitions. The band is one of the best that I've ever had. It's really exciting to get to show that to everybody in our community and represent our school in a national scale. The band's schedule was jam-packed from September 29th through October 19th. In just a few days, the band will go on to the 6A state championship. Reporting for ECSN, I'm Sailor Picaro. Thank you, Sailor. Over at Lucy Beckham, weapon detectors have been installed at the entrances of the school. ECSN reporter Taylor Gunst tells us why they were installed and how they affect day-to-day -day operations. Some big changes are coming to the way Lucy Beckham students go to school in the morning. In an effort to keep Beckham a safe school, they installed weapon detectors at the front and back entrances into the school. The weapon detectors are tested and certified to detect weapons that can cause mass casualties. When students get to school, they have to take their Chromebooks and binders out of their bags before going through the detectors. Administrators admit they were unsure of the tone it would send to students, but they say overall, it's made the school more secure. I was actually kind of worried about what kind of tone it would be setting in the morning, having kids go through it first thing, but me being able to work it, I've noticed that I get to check in with kids, like I greet them, I say hello, good morning, how are you, to way more kids than what I was doing before we had the detectors. It's kind of a hassle in the morning and I feel like we shouldn't have to worry about like coming to school and worrying about our safety in the first place. Like I understand why and I appreciate that the county is like putting these actions into place, but I don't know, I wish we didn't have to come to school and like be worried about it anyway. It's being proactive, it's getting in front of the problem versus reacting to a problem. 
Administrators shared a survey with staff and parents regarding the weapon detectors. Almost 90% of the feedback showed support towards the impl implementation of weapon detectors. Reporting for ECSN, I'm Taylor Gunst. Thanks, Taylor. Each month, we're starting to highlight a program at the CAS. This month, Addie Burnham takes us for a spin around the cosmetology program. I've grown from like the first time doing a haircut or a blowout on someone to how much better everything looks now and how much quicker I am at everything, just feeling so much more comfortable mixing color or doing a haircut or just being able to talk to the clients and not being nervous anymore. Juniors are learning haircutting, nails, blowouts. They're going to be taking clients soon and that will be on Friday afternoons, but we would love to have as many people in that we can. It would be nice to be able to offer it to more kids and a wider range of kids. More programs like this should be everywhere for like everybody. It should be available for other schools to do like. I know it's available for Lucy Beckham and Wando to come here and do it, but I feel like it would be really cool for other schools to do it as well. Phew. Now that all the boring news is out of the way, I can finally go back to the kitchen. Today I'm making a grilled cheese with a fresh tomato soup. Welcome back to Fish Food. My name's Fisher and I'm here to teach you how to elevate the food you can find in the school cafeteria. Today, we're going to elevate a grilled cheese and tomato soup. We first start with the soup. Melt two tablespoons of butter and throw it into a large pan. Chop half an onion and throw it in as well. Cook the onion for about three minutes until it becomes translucent on medium. Next, add, 28, add a 28 ounce can of San Marzano tomatoes as much salt as you like, and a cup of chicken stock. Bring to a simmer and let it sit uncovered for 20 minutes. While that's going, let's start the grilled cheese. First, get your two slices of bread. I've got a white mountain loaf, but anything will work. Next, spread low-fat mayo on two sides of two pieces. Now, the most important part, the cheese. A good cheese combination can make or break your sandwich. So I tested lots of combinations trying to find the best three that would work and I decided with two slices of Swiss, one slice of Gouda, and a sprinkle of shredded cheddar. Now that the sandwich is assembled, get a small non-stick pan, turn it up to medium, and wait for it to get hot. Drop in the sandwich, let it cook for three and a half minutes on one side, flip, and let it go for another three and a half minutes. Remove when it's golden brown and crispy. Our tomatoes should be just about done now, so let's take them off the heat and finish the final step. Pour or scoop the tomatoes into a blender with a splash of heavy cream and blend on high until it's light in color and looks like a soup. Add the soup to a bowl and sprinkle on some fresh basil. Slice the sandwich into triangles and enjoy. And that's how you make a grilled cheese and tomato soup. As we end the show, you're looking inside our ECSN control room. The show wouldn't be possible without all the help behind the scenes. Thanks for watching. Signing off for ECSN, I'm still Fisher Bond.